I'd like to welcome everyone to Becoming Human, Evolution, Science, and the Soul. My name is Austin Walker. I'm the director of the Newman Forum, which is the Lumen Christi Institute's introduction to the church's intellectual tradition for high school students. The Newman Forum does this through a series of small seminars and major conferences held both online and in person throughout the year. Old events that we've done can be viewed on our YouTube page, the Lumen Christi YouTube page. In February of this year, we had a very interesting event called Creation, Artistic, and Divine, where we talked about the physics of creation and the theology of human creativity. Uh, Professor Steve Barr gave an excellent talk on the Big Bang, and Professor Jenny Martin gave a, a very exciting talk on human creativity and its connection to God's creation of the world. Our event today will be a lecture and discussion with Dr. Chris Baglow, the director of the Science and Religion Initi Initiative at the University of Notre Dame's McGrath Center for Church Life. Uh, he is the author of the premier theology textbook in the field, Faith, Science, and Reason, Theology on the Cutting Edge. I've also learned from Chris that he has, I asked him as a joke, but it turns out he does have a three-legged dog uh, in addition to all of the other accomplishments, professional and personal. He has a three-legged dog. So we know directly that he is no heartless proponent of nat natural selection. Since he's kept that dog. <laughs> um, before we begin anymore, I'd like to thank a number of our co-sponsors who made this event possible. The University of St. Mary the Lake Mundelein, the Archdiocese of Chicago Vocation Office, McGrath Institute for Church Life, the Society for Catholic Scientists, the Beatrice Institute, and I'd also like to thank a number of our high school co-sponsors, Bennett Academy, Fenwick High School, Northridge Prep, St. Ignatius College Prep, and Willows Academy, and many other groups as well that have brought uh, a group of high school students. We're excited about all of these co-sponsorships and we're pleased to continue to develop them. Dr. Baglow will begin with a 35 minute lecture after we'll have a 20 minute Q&A for students to ask Dr. Baglow any questions they may have. Then all the high school students will break out into discussion groups. We'll end the event by 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Parents, teachers, youth ministers, and others are welcome to log off at 3.30 when the discussion groups start, but we do have a discussion group designated for all of you if you'd like to continue the conversation from 3.30 to 4. Now, as a final reminder, everyone should have their cameras muted and microphones turned off during the lecture and Q&A. Students, please rename yourselves, as I've said, first name with your group in parentheses. Adults, please rename yourself first name, last initial, and group leaders, your first name, last initial, and the group that you are a part of. Uh, with those logistics out of the way, I'd like to welcome Dr. Baglow, who will explain to us how it is that we became human. All right, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen here. Hopefully all of you can see that. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you in, in a sense. I know this is kind of the best we can do to get together these days, but um, I'm very, very happy that I was asked to present to you on this and uh, this topic of evolution, science, and the soul. I am a theologian, not a scientist, but I've had the benefit of being um, in uh, working with and in dialogue with many scientists on this very topic. So what I'd like to do, since I am a theologian, is begin theologically with um, this quote from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, um, which in a sense summarizes the issue that we're going to be talking about today, but also um, some of the difficulty in understanding um, how it is that human beings are both a product of natural evolution, but also the image of God and specially created by God. So, as the uh, book of Genesis says, the Lord God fashioned the human being out of the clay of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so he became a living being. I put the Hebrew in here so that we could note that even in this biblical passage, we see a real connection between being a human being and the clay of the ground natural physical elements. And so as we look at a little outline of what we'll be doing here, the first part of my talk is going to be about the clay of the ground, talking about evolution and what evolutionary science has revealed about how human beings came to be on this planet um, through the natural process of evolution from other primates. Then secondly, I want to talk about the soul 
Notice that in the passage that we read, um, God breathes into the nostrils of human beings the breath of life, a picture that shows something significant about human beings. The Bible tells us that the other animals also have the breath of life. But there's a special relationship between God and the human being in this passage. And so, um, in fact, the very word living being in Hebrew is nephesh, which can be translated as often translated as soul or life principle. And so the church teaches that the human soul is, uh, and human life principle is different from, qualitatively, from the other animals, that it even survives death. So the second part of my talk is going to be about that. What do we mean by soul? What makes us different from the other animals? And then finally, the biggest issue is bringing these two things together. How is it possible for us to look at being human as both being an animal, but also being the unique image of God with a soul that does not perish at death? And that's going to be the third part of my presentation in which I will suggest that in human origins, which we're gonna be looking at, but also in every human conception, God, our creator, is involved in an intimate and unique way that is different from the way that he is present to the rest of creation. Now, just to put this on the table, uh, the Bible talks to us about human life, human beings as um, the image of God, but, that doesn't mean that we are the only rational uh, images of God in the universe. So if there are others out there, what I have to say about the soul would apply to them too. All right. With that in mind, we'll go to the first part here, the clay of the ground. So to get us started, I want to bring you on um, kind of an imaginary sense on a fossil hunting expedition that occurred back in the year 2000 around Ethiopia. And while fossil hunting, <clears throat> one scientist spotted this small skull peering out of the clay down a slope. And so years of painstaking excavation revealed other bones as well for this fossil, a torso, a foot, a kneecap, tiny finger bones. And as you can see, the skull even contained teeth which further examination revealed to be baby teeth. So they named this fossil baby Salam. Salam means peace. Scientists have dated these fossils, these bones, to be about 3.3 million years old, making it the world's oldest fossil of its kind. This is a recreation of the fossil by scientists to give us an idea of what this creature would have looked like. Now, when you see it, I don't, like me, I, perhaps, you might immediately think, wow, that looks just like a chimpanzee baby. And it does, but there's a big difference. Although this baby, baby Salam, had an upper skeleton and skull with chimpanzee-like features and shoulder blades that would be useful as any other chimp for climbing, she had a lower skeleton like ours, which meant she could walk upright naturally. Uh, chimps can also get upright for a very short period of time, but for her this was a natural activity. I took uh, this video with my phone, so it's rather fuzzy, but this is a video where you can see the difference between, sorry for the background noise, between how a chimpanzee walks and how a human walks and how baby Salem would walk. As you can see, her lower body is built for walking. You can say that in this evolutionary ancestor called Australopithecus, that the journey towards being human in the full sense like us started from the bottom up, right? From the lower body and this upright walking. One of the cool things about this is that the discovery of baby Salem corresponded to other um, discoveries. For instance, in 1976, in Laetoli, Tanzania, 
these 3.6 million year old fossilized footprints were discovered that had been made by a group of three australopiths who traveled across open land through volcanic ash between one wooded area to another. And then their footprints were fossilized. Well, when studying these, as you can see here, analyzing these, scientists see a walking pattern like ours, right? Uh, upright walking where the feet are striking in ways quite similar to the way our modern feet do. And um, pretty cool. Now, when we move from here, we're gonna be doing a very, very brief tour of a very long period of time we see other traits emerging. The next significant group of fossils come from what are called obligate bipeds. These are hominins that have bodies up and down that are built for upright walking all of the time, striding across the savanna, right? That also, right around the same time, stone tools such as this hand axe are found. Um, as time goes on, these become more and more sophisticated and refined. You might wonder what these tools were used for. Well, the best, uh, the best hypothesis on this, and what most scientists agree, is that they were used for killing and butchering animals. So around the same time, uh, our evolutionary ancestors started eating meat. Now, that's really important because it meant that more metabolism could go to brain development. Um, meat packs energy in a way that vegetable matter doesn't. So um, by eating meat, they could actually begin developing more brain power. The skull size also started to grow, uh, as, you might, as you might guess. Um, we also see evidence of what's called prosociality. Um, that is the caring for other members of groups who could not care for themselves. Now we're talking about now Homo erectus. I know I have a lot of detail over here. These are slides for a grad course, um, but you don't need to pay attention to all of those if, uh, if you don't want to. So anyway, but in the ruins of a medieval town called Manisi in the Republic of Georgia, Archaeological digs unearth artifacts and fossils of this species, Homo erectus, um, dating to approximately 1.8 million years ago. And going back to this idea of prosociality, one of those uh, skulls belonged to an aged male whose tooth sockets had shriveled and who had been toothless except for one tooth for many years before he died. Now, for him to have survived without teeth meant that he had to have been cared for by his relatives. Um, maybe soft foods were chosen for him or even chewed for him in order to be able to eat. And so we see caring for other members of a group developing uh, at this particular period. Now, this is another important issue here is that up until Homo erectus, all of the fossils of our evolutionary ancestors are found in Africa. But Manisi is thousands of miles away from Africa. So with new ways to get around obligate bipeds, remember being able to walk, and that's, that's their natural form from top to bottom, bigger brains, social cooperation like we see in prosociality, they came out of Africa and spread all over Europe and Asia even down into the islands of Indonesia. So over here, we see the earliest fossils, and then here's Manisi way up here, and we can see the spread of where these fossils have been found. In fact, the first um, fossil was called Java Man because it was found in Java, far, far away from Africa. Um, so at least around 400,000 years ago, we see a new species probably emerging from Homo erectus, which are called Homo heidelbergensis because they were found around Heidelberg, Germany. Um, and Homo heidelbergensis, with them, we find evidence of dwelling places with hearths um, for burning wood, cooking food. We also find 
projectile hunting weapons, like these wooden spears. And this kind of spear making requires a number of things. So here's what scientists gather from this. First of all, a high level of manual dexterity, far beyond the hand axes of our earlier species, um, a high level of intelligence, and spear hunting for large game takes a great and incredible amount of group cooperation and coordination. Now, Homo heidelbergensis, these were the, the ancestors of the Neanderthals, but scientists also trace our own species back to them, but in Africa, not in Europe. So we have taken kind of a detour out of Africa here into Europe, but we have to go back to Africa to continue our part of the story. Around 300,000 years ago, scientists find fossils that have the kind of distinctive anatomy of modern Homo sapiens, especially in skulls found in Northern Africa, but also in uh, the Levant, in the near Middle East, around Palestine, Israel. Um, but up until about 120 to 100 to 60,000 years ago, these remains are found accompanied by artifacts that aren't very different in any significant way from Homo heidelbergensis or from Neanderthals. Um, it seems that our modern human skeletal structure arrived long before we find those unique qualities that we have that it seems these other species did not. Um, now, so when do we begin to see things that we can say, ah, yes, this is specifically and uniquely kind of human in our sense. Um, we find those around 77,000 years ago, the earliest example, the earliest artifact we have in a cave, Blombos Cave in South Africa. And this piece of ochre with, uh, with its cross hatch pattern uh, is, pardon me, Oops, I lost my, uh, there we go, sorry. I'm in a classroom that's uh, eco-friendly and so the lights turn off if you don't move around. But anyway, this piece of ochre, notice it has these incised parallel lines and these cross-hatch patterns, is the first known example of an artifact that can be confidently interpreted as symbolic. What do we mean by that? Well, in symbolism, Two things are brought together in such a way where one thing stands for something else. This is essential to human language, um, human art, and various other ways in which we communicate and think about the world. And once we see symbolism, we're beginning to see the work of other human beings who are like us um, in even more significant ways than we find in our other evolutionary ancestors. Consider, for example, these 30 to 40,000 year old artifacts. And you begin to see that other animals don't do stuff like this. We don't have evidence of even other hominins, even erectus, um, Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis, producing things like this. Now, we're gonna talk more about that in a moment. But before we do, I wanna stop here because we've really come to the end of the first part of this presentation and go back to our biblical verse, the Lord God formed the human being out of the clay of the ground. What we see is with the eyes of faith, God through natural processes forming humanity. That took millions of years. It really took billions of years going back to the big bang and the development of the universe and ultimately development of life forms. Finally, at the far, far end of the process, the development of more sophisticated primates and then ultimately us. This is a process that unfolded with fits and starts, with many detours, many side roads, right? But we could see that whole process as matter maturing. The world was created by God, is created by God to be life producing, but God and his patience allows it to reach the level in which it can begin to produce life and then ultimately human life. And at that moment when evolution had produced a brain capable of the processes of language and symbolism, 
we now no longer speak of hominins simply, but of humans in the full sense. Rational animals, very important term, in whom the life pattern of the species that went before us is taken up as the foundation of a new way of being and acting. Now, if you've never studied human origins before, you might be thinking, wait a minute, you just showed us creatures that make tools, creatures that build houses, that cook meat and vegetables too, that care for their sick and elderly, right? Neanderthals, who we didn't even talk about, we know for sure, buried their dead. What makes us so special? For the Catholic tradition, the difference is the difference between animal intelligence and human reason. And that's why that word or that term rational animal is so important. St. Thomas Aquinas, who's over here, a picture of him on the right, um, one of the greatest thinkers in history, saw this difference clearly. And he saw it without disregarding the incredible mental powers of animals. He was aware that animals were capable of incredible things. They, for instance, he noted, have the ability to learn from past experience. They're capable of judging situations correctly and learning to solve problems. St. Thomas calls this the, the, the ability to make natural judgments. But Thomas says, however, to pass judgment on one's judgments belongs only to reason. The power of reason allows our species alone to make judgments about our judgments, to hold real things in our minds mentally, to come to understand them, not only for how they concern us and how we might use them, but for what they are. And that also makes human beings free in a way that we could not apply to the other animals. We, by making judgments about our judgments, become responsible for the choices we make, for the actions we perform. We can choose to do this or that in a moral way because we can stand back and think about the nature of this or that choice in relationship to goodness. So, moving on then, symbolism in language is at the heart of what it means to be a rational animal and being specifically human, right? Human animals, rational animals have the power of reason. We have the ability to capture some aspect of a thing in an abstract concept or symbol in language, and then to reason with respect to it, to develop a deeper comprehension of how it relates to other things. Consider, for example, our uh, capacity for what has been called abstraction, which is kind of a misleading term. But we can entertain concepts like circularity, like beauty, truth, and goodness, and we can draw from them principles that apply in all instances of each. We can judge the truth of assertions like two plus two equals four and much more uh, sophisticated ones, and then apply it to all combinations of quantity. We can do math without objects. A computer can do that too, but only when a human being programs it to do so. We're capable of coming to the conclusion that some things are necessarily true. We know that one doesn't equal zero. And once we know what one means and what zero means, and once we have the concept of inequality, we know that this has to be the case in any possible universe. In other words, human beings have capacities that transcend the powers of the other animals. And as far as we can see, even of our evolutionary ancestors, our intellectual powers transcend purely material applications and have infinite applications. And this is because uh, our tradition would say something distinctive about what it means to have a human soul, a human life principle. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas says it this way, I'll go on to the next slide, down here at the bottom. There exists therefore an operation of the soul which so far exceeds the bodily nature of a human being that it is not even perform performed by any bodily organ. And such is the operation of the rational soul. The human brain, he's saying here, does not reason. 
It just so happens to be the material organ without which we could not reason. There's more to human beings than physical bodily stuff, even more than the brain. The church has taught about this uh, quite often throughout our history, and most recently, St. John Paul II has said this. He opened the door, or um, was completely open to the possibility of accepting evolutionary science for understanding where human beings come from. But then he also said this, the doctrine of faith affirms that man's spiritual soul is created directly by God. The human soul on which man's humanity definitively depends cannot emerge from matter since the soul is of a spiritual nature. You can think about these examples from Thomas Aquinas and the points that I made uh, you know, just in the last few minutes. From the theological perspective, the human difference is located in the fact that the soul is spiritual, directly created by God. It is not merely the product or result of a biological process. And that's true of every human being, not just those hundreds of thousands of years ago, but every human conception the church teaches, must involve the direct creation of the soul of a human being by God. Okay, with that in mind, we can now try to bring it all together. How can we be both the product of this evolutionary process that we've looked at, as well as directly or specially created by God? Well, let's start by looking at what we should not say, right? We're not saying that nature makes a body and then God loads up a soul cannon and shoots a soul into it, right? That somehow God makes this thing or that nature makes this thing and God makes that thing, the soul, attaching the two to each other. We are unified body, soul composites. We aren't two things a living body over here and a mysterious ghost that is the real self that's somehow connected to it, right? The soul is not a separate thing that God makes, but along with the matter from which our bodies are made is one of two principles that make a human being a living being. St. Thomas Aquinas would say that no part of us is simply soul and no part of us is merely body. In fact, a body without a soul is not really a body, it's a corpse. So we have a paradox here. From one perspective, human beings are the natural product of primate evolution, the end result of this meandering process that involved trends like a bigger brain, more sophisticated tools, more social cohesion and social organization. But we are also rational and spiritual beings, the product of God's loving initiative that engages each of us from the moment of our existence, from the first moment of our existence, and a special relationship with our creator. Um, one way that we can think about this, I think that's helpful to bring the two together, comes from the International Theological Commission, which said this, that God can, and I'm quoting, bring about effects that transcend the capacity of created causes acting according to their natures in which God directly causes the soul in what they, what they say is a non-disruptive way. That is, God causes the natural prospect, process, sorry, God causes the natural process of human reproduction, of human procreation, to produce something more than mere material causes can normally produce. So human souls in a sense, do come from parents. Through the fertilization of the female ovum by the male sperm, human parents are created causes acting according to their sexual natures. But what makes human reproduction different from all other examples of reproduction among other animals is not that God disrupts this process, but that he causes it to produce a life principle that transcends that of the other animals. The human soul the very life principle that causes a human body to be a living body of a specific kind is not a thing that God makes separately. Rather, 
due to the free unfolding of a universe that he sustained in being and sustains in being precisely for this reason, a body of the humankind is, of its essence, a body that must have a spiritual soul to be the kind of creature that it has evolved to be. A body that, in the words of the 17th century Catholic philosopher John of St. Thomas, quote, calls out to God out of justice for a soul. The spiritual soul is a principle that, with the body, makes a human being this kind of living being. Evolution, according to the God-given laws of the universe, due to the activity of creatures over millions of years, has yielded a situation in, where in our universe, there is at least in one case, a material creature for whom to be spiritual is its natural state, whose origins implicate God and require his direct involvement. This wonderful truth about being human reveals another that science could never discover, but which faith and reason can together discern that Homo sapiens, our species, is the ultimate reason for why the universe exists, the point of God's creative activity. From all eternity, God did not merely want to share his goodness with creatures, but he wanted for there to be a creature that could receive the gift of the created universe and the gift of their own lives and ultimately the gift of his divine life with understanding and freedom. In other words, in creation, God says, let there be, which in Hebrew is amen, to the whole universe. But he wanted there a creature who could say amen, let it be in return. John Paul II captured this in a beautiful quote, which I'll um, offer you now. Creation is a gift, he says, because man appears in it. Who is an image of God is able to understand the very meaning of the gift and God's call from nothing to existence. Man appears in creation as the one who received the world as a gift, and vice versa, one can also say that the world has received man as a gift. Gifts are something uh, in which, in order to receive something as a gift, in order to understand it as a gift, we have to have reason. In order to receive it fully as a gift, we have to have freedom, the capacity to respond with our whole being. That's what we find in human beings. The created universe could not be a gift unless there was a creature who, being capable of understanding, could wonder at its beauty, respond to it with delight, begin to comprehend its patterns and laws. That's the human difference. And the paradox of the special creation of the human soul, it lies precisely in that unique human capacity which places us in an intimate relationship with God, who calls us out of being into, uh, into being out of nothingness, and then calls out to us in love. Finally, I want to return uh, to our opening verse, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, where I noted uh, God that God forming humanity out of the clay of the ground shows us, right, that all of us come from the natural world. And along with that, all human beings are from God's good earth. No one of us can say, I or my race is somehow better than all others. In the words of Pope Benedict XVI, despite every distinction that culture and history have brought about, it is still true that we are, in the last resort, the same earth, formed from dust and destined to return to it. The Bible says a decisive no to all racism and to every human division. So I'll end there and uh, open things up for Q&A. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chris. What we'd like to do now is for students who have questions, we're hoping that the students themselves, high school students, can ask questions. So if you can use the raise hand feature. Uh, we'll make sure to get everyone who has a question. Uh, they'll have an opportunity to answer it. So if you're looking for a you're looking for a way to raise your hand, you go to participants. Uh, you see the persistence tab, and then in the bottom right, you should see the raise hand feature. We have Sarah. We have three going already. Uh, so Dr. Baglow, we'll start with Sarah from Saint Ignatius. Sarah, if you want to unmute yourself, you don't have to turn on your video. Just unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Walker. Hello, Mr. Baglow. I thought the um the presentation was very informative. So thank what, you. What you said was that only humans have souls, and therefore only humans can go to heaven. So, um, what about our earlier ancestors? Do they count as humans that have souls? Um, you might have noticed that I had a 35 minutes, so I didn't get into this too much. But every living thing, in the way that St. Thomas Aquinas would think about it, has a soul, right? What makes the human soul different is that it demonstrates capacities that go beyond what um, we see in the other animals and are capable of transcending material reality. Therefore, they are intrinsically immaterial and capable, therefore, of surviving death, of actually surviving the death of the body. Um, now, what we would say about other animals uh, is not necessarily that they don't or somehow won't ever, right, that, that their death is final, but actually the possibility that God, who will bring about a new heaven and a new earth, will make it possible for them somehow too. So what we're saying is that for human beings, we have this intrinsic capacity to transcend death, right? Not necessarily that they don't. Is that helpful? Thank you, yes. Those brings okay. about a new perspective. Excellent. So we'll go on next to Mia from Marian Catholic. Mia, if you can uh, unmute yourself, ask your question. Hello, Mr. Bigelow. Hello. Um, I did think your presentation was very informative, but I do have a question. Go for it. So um, I was really intrigued with um, your use of um, Salam. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, I don't really know. But, um, my, Salam, yeah. My question is, if um, that particular monkey developed from a human, I guess, over time, then what is stopping he, um, monkeys from completing their evolutionary process and still becoming humans today? Oh, that's a good question. So remember, an evolutionary process doesn't necessarily have to end up in everything becoming conscious, rational, and human, right? Um, God loves diversity. He loves everything that he has created. Um, so in regard to uh, the development of, say, chimpanzees today, um, I mean, I don't know how many millions and millions of years it would take, but they have kind of diverged from us in such a way that they have developed a life pattern that doesn't require rationality in the same way that being human does. Is that helpful? Um, mm. No, not no, enough. Huh? No, not enough. But I do have another question besides that, though. Okay. Um, so in the beginning, I know you referenced um, Jesus, well, not Jesus, but God breathing life into the clay of the ground and everything. So yeah. where exactly does Adam and Eve and Noah and all of those stories that are found to be in the Bible like, like, where do they really fit in with this evolutionary process? Like, did this happen after, like, the monkeys decided they wanted to be humans and decided to start walking? Like, like where does this all fit in? So what I'll, I'll jump in for just a second. Chris, uh, we want to remind everybody, Mia, thank you for your interest. We'll want to hold it in the future to just a single question. I didn't say that before, so I'm not criticizing you, Mia. And Chris, I know this goes yeah. far afield, so if you can... Um, take the briefest possible route to an answer since oh, I know okay, it's, it's yeah, far okay. beyond what I'll, we're supposed to do. I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, so we have two creation accounts in the Bible. In the first one, human beings are created on the second to last day of the seven day story. In the second creation account, the human male is created first, then all the animals, and then the human woman. That difference shows us that it's not trying to tell us how human beings evolve, right? Or exactly the process by which each of us came about. It's trying to teach us something deeper. Even the very names, Adam, which as we've already seen, means ground or earth. And Eve means life, right? These stories are about showing us the deepest meaning of God's creation, why and his ultimate intention for it, rather than 
what science does, which is shows us the progression by which this comes about. Those two things don't have to be in conflict with each other. From a Catholic perspective, at least, they can't be in conflict with each other. Since they're both true, they both show us different perspectives of one reality, which is God's creation. Great. We'll go now to Ramses from Fenwick. Ramses, if you can unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, so you briefly touched on God and the Big Bang. Uh, well, what is God's relation to the Big Bang? Okay, God's relation to the Big Bang is like God's relationship to every other moment in time, right? He is the ultimate source of all that exists. But he doesn't cause things the way creatures cause things. There is no God standing back there before the Big Bang, thinking about it, and then deciding to you know, start the explosion, like someone who's shooting fireworks on the 4th of July. God causes all things to be, but in his love and goodness, he also causes them to be causes of each other. And so I would say that God is saying, at the first moment of the universe, with the Big Bang, let there be light. And God is saying right now at this moment, let there be light. There doesn't have to be a difference for God because God is eternal. His reality is a perfect now with no beginning, middle, or end. And he creates a universe in which there are beginnings, middles, and ends. But that universe is the product of his eternal creative act, not something that limits God. So how is God related to the Big Bang? The same way he's related to this moment and to every moment as its ultimate cause. Great. We'll go now to John from Loyola, Loyola Academy. Hi, John. How's it going, Dr. Bagwell? Thank you so much. Um, thank you sure. to the Lumen Christi Institute and to Mr. Walker as well. Um, fantastic presentation. My question uh, is similar to Mia's, um, but it's in, term of, in terms of the doctrine of the fall. At what point yeah. um, does this sort of human tendency towards sin and um, the original sin of our parents, Adam and Eve, how does that factor in um, to the creation of the soul? Is that, that you know, happening as the soul is sort of animates the human body at, at what point does the, the fall sort of factor into humanity and the creation of, of humans? Well, it's certainly something that happens at the beginning of human history, right? It couldn't be something that, um, that, uh, you know, uh, happens before human history begins because without free rational creatures, there can't be a fall. There can't be sin. Somewhere along the line, what we see is that human relationality to God and to others becomes damaged through human choice. And that affects all human beings, right? Now, our inclination towards sin, if you think about any of your inclinations, you can see that the very inclinations that we have towards some good behaviors can also be inclinations towards bad behaviors. Think about the horrible situation that our country is in right now. Um, and the reality that because we cohere closely in social groups, we can also develop the tendency to see others as not part of that group, right? As an out group um, in something like racism as I ended my talk with, right? But the tendency to cohere closely is, is, does not necessarily require that we also shut others out. Um, and we can see this in regard to, and I won't go into all the uh, uh, every example possible, but I think we can see this kind of thing that our, our, our human nature is the question to us, right? Well, that's why the church teaches that at the beginning, God would have given humanity graces that would have made it possible for us to always integrate in the right direction, in the direction of goodness and love, right? These inclinations that we have from nature, from evolution. Um, but... We don't have those now. And the reason that we don't is because of this rupture of communion with God and with one another that we see at the beginning of human history. How many did it involve? Um, I don't see why it, could have, why it couldn't have been 2,000 rather than just two, right? A first human community in which, in this close cohesion, right, some sin and draw others towards sin. That's certainly, 
doesn't seem to me to be something that could not have happened. Um, and so um, consequently, I don't, I'm not concerned about scientific findings that tell us that there were more human beings at the beginning of human history than just two. Um, but regardless of that, I think that's, that's my best answer for how we can talk about the fall. Thank Great. you so much. We'll go on to Samuel now, Samuel from Marian Catholic. And if there are any of you who are watching on the YouTube live stream, we've fixed all the Zoom issues, so you should be able to get back in here. Um, so you can go ahead and do that. But we will go to Samuel from Marian Catholic. All right. Uh, hi. First off, I thought you gave a really great presentation. And one part right. that was really interesting to me was the, were you talking about kind of the relationship between the human body and the brain and the soul and how the soul isn't inherently a part of the body, but it is inherently connected. So my question is about in the future as technology progresses um, and, you know, computers advance, if we could somehow take a human brain and put that into a computer or create what would be a human brain in a computer, would that still have a soul or would it be considered human? Or what's your theological understanding of that? Yeah. Um, okay, well, first of all, when I said, when you talk about body and soul being connected, our language fails us, and this is not your fault or mine, our language fails us in describing the relationship between body and soul. Because as I said, without a soul, a body is not a body at all, right? The soul is what makes this body a body. And being body and soul is what makes me a human being. So one quote I didn't share from St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, which I think is really important to remember here, is he says, the soul is not the entire man. And I am not my soul. The soul is not I, is another way of translating it. Um, even when our souls survive death, this is not God's ultimate intention for us. That's why we profess believing in the resurrection of the body, right? Um, because God wants us to be what he created us to be, which is a union of body and soul. In regard to artificial intelligence, I think that the very nature of what we know about artificial intelligence does not lead us to the point where we would say that this would be the kind of originating sort of intellectual capacity that we find in human beings. Because wherever you go back, you will ultimately find someone, some human being, making that machine capable of what it's doing, right? And there's other things too that I think that I didn't point out, I just kind of went to the nitty gritty, that we would add to this. Um, self-reflection and self-consciousness and appreciation for beauty. These are all, like, these are examples of things that human beings have naturally in a way that's not the product of human programming. Um, and that demonstrates something different about human beings. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the best uh, I could do it the, in, uh, in short notice on that one, but I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Sure. Chris, I'm glad we got the science fiction question because uh, it's, it's not awesome a good Q&A unless we get the science fiction stuff. So it's Charles is next, but Charles, what I'm going to ask you to do is wait for the time being because we're only allowing high school students right now to ask questions. Uh, there'll be a time later after 3.30 for all of us to discuss. So we'll go to Thomas uh, from the homeschool. Thomas from the homeschool, if you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so my question is, I don't know if like I missed something here, but in my mind, there's a big disconnect between, so at the beginning of creation, God created Adam and Eve, and they were perfect beings They were made in God's image. But mm -hmm. then man had to evolve from a less intelligent being to, what man is right now and so my question is like where is the disconnect in there did man have to evolve and then it and then man was bestowed a soul and became adam and eve and um then that's like how human history followed or did was at the god create adam and eve and then they sinned and that was the fall and then they went back to basically they went back to square one and then they we had to evolve after that and that's how we're, we're yeah. that's where we are right now. Well, a actually, what I'm what I'm saying is a little bit different than that. What I'm saying is that science demonstrates to us, and this has been recognized affirmatively by Pope Pius the Twelfth, John Paul the Second, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, um, that um, 
science shows us that we come from a long process of evolution from species that had some of our physical qualities and developed qualities more and more and more sophisticated as time went on, right? But that when we come to a certain point in human history, we begin to see something that cannot be purely reduced to an evolutionary process. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about language, symbolization, and above all, reason. So whenever that emerges, Right, then we're talking about our first human parents in the full sense of the word, human beings entirely like us. So that wasn't like there was an Adam and Eve created differently by God, and then they fell, and then there was a whole process of evolution that brought about all other human beings today. Well, what we're saying is that um, humanity itself, our first parents and all of us, are the product of this process, this natural process. Now, we don't find that in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is not about teaching science. The Bible is about showing us the deepest meaning of the creation that God created and above all of his plan to redeem us all in Christ and to give us eternal life. Right? So you can think about it this way. Scientists go out there in the field, analyze things to see how they work. And what they've discovered is that there is a process by which all of us emerge from species before us, okay? And then theology and the faith, um, the Catholic faith tells us why. Why did this happen, right? The deepest meaning behind God's decision to create in the first place. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We're going to go ahead and continue the Q&A until about 3.30 p.m. That's when we'll break to go to the discussion groups. We have three questions. You can continue to raise your hand if you have more. We'll try to get through as many as we can. So next is Nadia from IMSA. Um, thank you. Uh, I was interested in the linguistic and symbolization aspect, and I was wondering how the uh, evolution of the symbolism and iconography of a religion associated with the evolution of our mind, body, and soul. Wow, that's, now that's a question. I have a friend who is a professor at Southeastern Louisiana University who wrote a book called Supernatural Selection, How Religion Evolved. Um, and he oftentimes guest lectures in the classes that I teach at Notre Dame and also in programs that I run for, for high school science and religion teachers. His name is Matt Rossano. Um, I wish I had Matt on the line. I would, I would hand that one over to him, right? Um, but we certainly see that religion or evidence of religion going back to the very earliest artifacts we have from human beings. And his hypothesis, which I think is really interesting, is that one of the things that makes human beings different from all other species and capable of religion, of religious thought, religious iconography, et cetera, and um, worship and so on, is that human beings are different from all other species because we engage in costly rituals. That is, we engage in rituals that require something of us in their symbolism. So um, his idea here is that well, what we begin to see, so think about, you could think about the, um, the beautiful cave painting that I showed you, and then think about the Sistine Chapel, right? And that incredible work of art and what that required of Michelangelo in order to express his religious devotion. I think he's really on to something there. But that's about as much of an answer, I think, as I can give in this, in this forum for that. It's always great when a Q&A session opens up questions that can't be answered within, uh, yes, that's within right. the time. All right, Alia from Marian Catholic, and then we'll get Magali from St. Ignatius. We'll make sure to get both of you. Alia, go ahead. Hi, amazing presentation, by the way. Well, oh, thank um, you. My question is, if death was only made and brought into existence after the fall, then how did our ancestors have to bury their dead? Right. Okay, good question. Catholics don't believe that death, biological death of any creatures, only came about at the fall. What we believe is that because of our souls, because of our special nature that we've been talking about throughout this, God would have given, in a way beyond nature, the gift of immortality 
right? So in other words, the ability to continue on. Death is a natural part of animal life. And that goes back, and that's why we find, say, fossils of dinosaurs, etc. God was going to give us something more, and the fall and sin preempted that, which is why we believe in Christ, that God comes in order to redeem us and give us everlasting life in the resurrection of the body, right? So Christ restores what was lost in the fall for humans, but not say for microorganisms or for dinosaurs or for our evolutionary ancestors who were not fully human like we are. Thank Great. you. Great. Now we'll go to Magali. Magali from St. Ignatius. Thank yes. you. Um, my question is if you think that the way that humans identify themselves as in like sexuality and their sex, is that part of evolution or like part of your basic human nature? Uh, well, whatever is part of our basic human nature would be part of evolution too, right? So, um, so could you could you specify a little bit more how we identify? Um, you know how like it's more popular to um, I guess identify as like like female, male, or non-binary, mm -hmm. and how that's become more popular. Do you yeah. think that? it's an evolution part of us or like it's just questioning like our basic i guess like um origin um i i once heard, heard a uh, uh an evolutionary uh, an evolutionary scientist talk about this he's trying to explain human origins and he said something interesting about what it about what it means to be human that might be helpful in this circumstance maybe not um, but we'll see, but, I, but, but it's worth sharing for sure. One of the things that makes us different, and I could go back and, you know, look at the anatomy, like that little video I showed you all. Um, one of the things that makes human beings different is that because of our ability to walk upright, um, females of our species have small birth canals, but what makes us capable of language symbolism on the material level requires really big skulls and brains. And he said, so imagine having this big brained baby having to be born out of this very small birth canal. He says, that baby has to be born entirely helpless. You probably noticed that about human beings. Puppies get moving around and get more dependent a lot more quickly than human babies do. I mean, we go on for years dependent on our parents, right? Um, I just found out that my son is going to be leaving and, and, uh, and, and taking a job in Dallas for the rest of the summer. He just turned 18 and he's moving out of the house. But that was 18 years that he was with us, right? That's because of, our, of, our, of this very point that he said. So he goes, begin to think about then all of the things we see in human life, um, maternal care, um, and various social roles, those things go back to this truth about human beings, that we're born helpless, and that we need people to array themselves around us in certain ways in order to keep us alive. Some of those ways are very flexible, others are not. What the Catholic Church teaches is that sexuality is not something simply social or cultural, but something that goes into the deepest essence of who we are, our identity as human beings. So male and female are, and man and woman, are essential to what it means to be human from the Catholic perspective. I'll just end with that one. And with that, what I'd like to do is for all of us, all of us who are muted, I'd like to thank Dr. Baglow so much for giving this talk, uh, the generosity of his time to talk and to participate in this Q&A.